Okay. So this talk is going to be about a certain criterion which gives a necessary and sufficient uh, condition for something to be a subgroup. It's not the usual definition of subgroup. It's just something uh, that uh, uh, it's just an alternate way of characterizing subgroups. So before I go into that, I want to uh, talk about something which is that you have seen fractions like this a over b. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now what does a over b mean? It's, you can think of it as a times 1 over b. You can also think of it as 1 over b times a. Okay. And the notation is unambiguous when you have, when you are working relative to a multiplication that's uh, commutative. Okay. Because then it's sort of clear. It doesn't matter whether you multiply by 1 over b on the right or multiply by 1 over b on the left. Okay. So, uh, However, if you are working in a non-commutative situation, there's a groups by default, you don't assume commutativity, then there are two interpretations of A over B. What are the two interpretations? Hmm? Uh, left multiplication and right multiplication. Left. So one, instead of 1 over B, we will write B inverse. So one possibility is? A times 1 over B. Okay, that's actually the right one, I guess. So A times 1 over B, which I'll call A times B inverse. And uh, the other one is the inverse times a. Yeah, okay. So this is called the left quotient. And this is called the uh, right quotient. And some people use the words in the reverse order. So it's the left quotient of a by b. They're both quotients of a by b. Okay. So now, uh, the claim is this, if you have a group and a non-empty subset, then if the subset is a subgroup, then it's closed undertaking both left and right quotients. And if it's closed undertaking left quotients, it's a subgroup. If it's closed undertaking right quotients, it's a subgroup. So to check something's a subgroup, it's equivalent to checking that it's closed undertaking left quotients and it's equivalent to checking it's closed undertaking right quotients. Okay. Uh, but, but it has to be non-empty first. So do you see why any subgroup has to be non-empty? Mm -hmm. It has to have the identity. the identity element, yes. Okay. So the non-empty is sort of part of our backdrop. Okay. Uh, so if a non-empty subset closed under left quotients, it's subgroup. Closed under right quotients, it's a subgroup. Okay. So let's uh, try to prove the equivalence of 1 and 2. A subgroup if and only if closed under left quotients. Uh, the proof of 1 e equivalent to 3 is similar. And once you've shown that 1 is equivalent to 2 and equal to 3, that will show all 3 are equivalent. Okay, so I'm going to try to concentrate on showing 1 implies 2 and 2 implies 1. You see why that's enough? You see that the proof will be similar for left and right. Hmm? Uh, left quotient and right quotient. You can, I mean, the same proof idea will work for both. Okay? Yeah, yeah I haven't seen the, the proof yet. How can I tell they're similar? They, one implies another. Oh, well, okay, there, there's actually a general principle. Uh, that says that in a group left and right, sort of anything you can do with left, you can have a similar thing on the right. But but we don't uh, get yet uh, know that general principle. But but you'll see this proof. You can adapt it either way. So we'll just do one equivalent to two. Okay, let's do one implies two. Okay. So I'll define a subgroup as a subset which is closed under group multiplication, the identity, and inverse. So it has the same identity as the whole group and the same inverse map as the whole group. Right. Some definitions of subgroup just say. It stores under multiplication and has an identity and inverse of its own, but we've shown that that's equivalent to saying the identity and inverse are the same as in the whole group. So we'll just use the definition which says same multiplication, identity, and inverse as in the whole group. Okay, so 1 implies 2. If H is a subgroup, why should it be closed under left quotients? Okay, so we want to show that if you take any two elements of a subgroup, then the left quotient is also in the subgroup. So why is that? Uh, well, subgroup is closed under identity. all three operations, okay. right? So, if A and B are in the subgroup, what else do we know is in the subgroup? B inverse is in the subgroup. So, now it's closed under? B inverse times A. Is it's closed under multiplication, so? B inverse A is an H, right? So we use closure under both inverses and multiplication. 
So we are done? I think so. Okay, yeah, we are done. Okay, anything else left to do? Well, we have to do the other direction, right? So this is interesting because we are just now saying it's going to just one operation, the quotient, and from that we have to deduce that it's actually closed under all three group operations. Contains the identity, closed undertaking inverses, and it's closed undertaking products. Okay. Uh, but but we have one thing going for us, which is it's non-empty, so you can pick something to begin with. And you can set A and B to be anything. And you can also set them to be equal to each other. Remember, in algebra, whenever we say things like this, we allow the inputs to be equal. Okay. So, what do you do? Use, you have to use non-empty somewhere. Okay, so what do you do? You take an element of H, call that U. U H. Yeah. yeah. Now, we want to use this. What do we set A and B as? U. Which one do we set as U? Oh, I thought we can set them both. Okay, U. fine. So, what do we get? U, U, or C, U, C, H. And what's U and what's U? E. Okay, good. So we are done with the with this thing. Okay, G in H implies G in words is in H. Okay, and this is oh, by the, I didn't write it, but this is where we use it's non-empty. Okay, it's crucial because if it were empty, then it wouldn't be a subgroup, as you said. Subgroups contain the identity. Okay, so now the next one. If you have an element in H, it's in words is in H. Okay. Take. G and E in H. Yeah, so what do you set A as? Just tell me what A is and set what the... Set A as E and... Mm -hmm. And B as? G. Okay. Uh, let's see, does that work? Yeah. Speak a G in words. E is an H in that G inverse is H. So in fact in this one, this actually it's important we do things in this sequence because here we are using the previous one, right? Mm -hmm. So here we use the previous thing that we've already shown the identity element is in H. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to do this step, right? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be able to take A as E because you're only allowed to take A and B as things in H. Okay, the next step. I want to show that x, y is in h. So I want to make uh, this thing my x and this thing my y. So what should b be and what should a be? Uh, uh, a, b, x, y, b. Oh, y, b, b, verse. No, I want to show x, y is in h, right? So uh, what should a be and what should uh, b be? <laughs> Sorry? No, it's just notation-wise is a bit confusing. So we should set. So I want to show x, y, not y, x. I think you were saying it for y, x, uh, which would be fine. But I've just written you want to show x, y, then h. So what should you set a as? And what should you set b as? A as x, b as y inverse. Then you'll get y, x as an h. I wanted to show x, y, then so you just switch oh, them. Oh, a up. as y inverse, b as x. Oh. A S Y B S X inverse. Okay, so set A equals Y, B equals X inverse. And why can you set B equals X inverse? Here we are using the previous thing, right? We are using that uh, it, that H is already closed under inverse. So, so this one we are using this one. You see? Mm -hmm. If we hadn't shown inverses first, we couldn't have done products. Okay, so what do we get? X, Y, C, H. Yeah, so let's just write it down. So B inverse A, which is X inverse inverse Y, which is the X, Y is in H. Great. Okay, so we have shown all of them, and we have shown them in a particular order. So we first use the non get the identity, then we use the uh, identity being in it, and we set. so in all of them we sort of used set A and B to be appropriately thing, and in each one we use the previous one. Okay, whereas this one we use non-empty. Now this is not not very important per se; it's just a nice exercise. Uh, it's sometimes it's useful in the sense that instead of show if there's a very routine exercise and 
you want to show something to the subgroup, instead of showing three conditions, you just show one condition as long as you show it's, it's non-empty. So now do you see that the same proof technique will work for one implies three and three implies one? Mm -hmm. Okay. 